probably going to be aiding for originally doing this um, bit, because he'd written a very long uh, article on Counterfire, very long but very good article on Counterfire, um, about 18 months ago, called Crisis of British Strategy. Uh, the point of which was to try and get away from the kind of day-to-day, -day, sort of very immediate way of talking about uh, politics that, that we all have. Um, Large business and politics does happen on a kind of day to day basis, uh, and start to try and point to some of the deeper um, problems that capitalism in Britain, Britain faces. Uh, deeper problems that, that, that have been there and building up for a good like 20, 30 years now, that's particularly kind of structure that capitalism has here, um, but one that nonetheless isn't particularly successful uh, in lots and lots of different ways, however much we gloss is kind of applied over the top of that. Uh, and so he, I think he was going to do the thing originally with some graphs and the rest of it, so I'm going to spare you the graphs at, at this point, but if you want to go and have a look, and I do recommend you dig out his article, uh, Buried Away in Counterfire, and, and have a read through it, because the, the wealth of the kind of information in there is pretty impressive. So I wanted to um, talk a bit about that, and then throw in some other pieces as well. That really, if you're talking about a crisis regime, uh, and this phrase regime was used during the, the Arab uprising, it tends to get used actually about places abroad, you know, uh, we, we have a government, uh, America has, has a government, um, you know, nice places like that have governments, and then the rest of the world has regimes, you know, which is some horrible sort of institution, you're supposed to think probably like a San Hussein or someone in Mary and Stash and all that, sort of, all that sort of business, whereas here, of course, we have a government, and I think Eddie's point was to say, well, actually, we, we do have something that is different to just a government that you elect, you have something that's longer lasting. Uh, that's there, that's kind of how the state organises itself, and it's a regime, it's a, it's a mode of operation uh, that, that persists over a long period of time, regardless of who you end up voting for, the thing more or less stays the same. So if you want to change things more fundamentally, you have to ch address the question of the regime, which is precisely uh, the issue that came through if you look at uh, the, the Arab Spring, uh, and actually what's, what's still continuing, of course, across the, the Middle East. Um, you can see that what you need to address is not just who your government is, that you chuck around the person at the top, you need to address the entire structure underneath it as well. So that was the thinking about saying this is a regime rather than simply a crisis of the British government. Because of course if you, and I'll come on to this, I mean on one level the government isn't in a particularly uh, great crisis, I don't, I don't think, for, for a number of reasons, not yet at any rate. Um, but that, that's related to, peculiarly, the wider crisis of, of the British regime, of this long-standing structure around the British state that enables capitalism in Britain to work in a certain way. Uh, and I think it boils down to a crisis really in, in three parts. I mean, crisis sometimes isn't quite the right word, because you can think of crisis something short and sharp, immediate, you know, a heart attack, that's a crisis, you have cancer, it's a sort of, it's a longer standing medical condition, it's something that you have to address, it might produce a crisis at some point, but it's not like the immediate thing here. Anyway, it's the words that, that we've ended up with, so but just bear in mind that this isn't meant to imply that everything's about to collapse tomorrow, it's meant to be a long-standing, something more like cancer than it is comparable to, to a heart attack, to sort of continue a, a kind of medical metaphor then. So three parts. Uh, I think the first one is uh, the decaying legitimacy of existing institutions. That We live in a, a very, very long-standing, well-established uh, capitalist state, one of the very first anywhere in the world. I think really only the uh, Dutch Republic uh, beat us to it. We have a ruling class that has been in place now for a good 350, yeah, 400 odd years, uh, that it has uh, a wealth of institutions around it that help sustain that rule, and it has wider than just uh, being able to, if necessary, beat people up and lock them up and the, the kind of coercive functions. It has a range of institutions that produce a, a sense of its own legitimacy and its own authority and its own capacity to, to lead uh, the rest of the country. So the decay in legitimacy, however, of those institutions. The second part is a decay of social democracy, which is um, the, the phrase that gets used to, to refer to basically Labour parties and Labour type parties that you get here, like we have a Labour party, and you get across uh, the rest of Europe and actually spreading into the rest of the world, but it's kind of classic type is in Europe, which is uh, a party often of the working class that would claim, at least historically, to represent the working class, that would aspire to take working class interests and give them often some parliamentary representation and to take those interests and to turn them into something that provides a kind of stable way, in effect, of organising and managing capitalism. And there's a crisis, I think, quite a sharp crisis, 
of that set of ideas in this uh, country, alongside a crisis, I think, of the historic organisation of social democracy, which is, is the Labour Party here. And the final bit, obviously, is, is the, not so much the crisis of the economy, but the decay of the economy, the steady decline of uh, British capitalism from what was once, obviously, you know, back to the 1870s, the biggest uh, economic power of the earth, to what it is even, you know, when I was born, it was what Britain would be about the fourth, maybe fifth largest economy in the world. If you look at the figures out from the World Bank uh, just last week, it is on some measures now down to ninth or tenth. So you can see this steady decline and decay of British capitalism relative to other capitalisms, and also internally, of course, internally it's in a state of, of some steady decline. So I'll go through those three bits and then sort of sum up uh, what, what, this, what this kind of means for us, this sort of long-term uh, picture. The first one, the crisis of legitimacy. Well, the collapse of trust. And again, AD's got the impressive figures of this, but I think it's just sort of obvious that if you take, you know, I'll just think back over my own lifetime, if you take the respect that, for instance, bankers might have once had, that, you know, you know got respect, but you'd at least trust them. I mean, if they were ever comic figures, like <coughs> Captain Mannering, who's comic precisely because he's in... He's in a position of authority, but he's making me ridiculous about it, but he's comic because of that failure. He's not comic because he's evil. He's comic because he's just a bit ludicrous. So if you have bankers, you know, enormously trusted, of necessity, because they run the bank and they're supposed to be looking after your money. And if you see what's happened, and the opinion polls confirm this overwhelmingly, that if you ask people, uh, even as late as the mid-1990s, coming to the 2000s, do, who do you most trust in society? Bankers. Peculiarly, come up very, very high, about 80-90% of people say, yes, we trust uh, people who work in banks, we trust bankers. If you ask them today, that's disappeared down to about 5%, and frankly, I'm surprised you'd even find that kind of level of support for these people after what's happened o over the last four or five years or so. Politicians, goes without saying, I think that the level of trust people have in politicians, particularly after the expensive scandal of 2009, is disintegrated. Uh, the level of trust in the BBC, another once, you know, very, very widely respected across society institution now, after the Jimmy Savile crisis and sex abuse and the rest of it, clearly uh, somewhere very, very different to that. And you can carry on like this, and you can go down a great long list of these institutions that are not there necessarily um, to, they're not there to beat you up or something, although note that de you know, declining confidence in the police is also being very uh, pronounced. But they're there to, to sustain a certain idea of how the country is running. They're there to uh, convince you that things are perfectly all right one way or the other, and that people have a confidence in these institutions that things will be kind of all right. But it is perfectly okay. If you watch the BBC, you can trust what it's saying, for instance. But if you go to the bank and put your money in, it's probably going to be safe, and the guy running it isn't a complete spiff. That's what you'd like to think about the world. That very obviously can't be sustained. So there's this crisis of legitimacy right the way across those set of institutions, with, I think, two, two exceptions. And it's notable that, partly, I think, as a response to this, in effect, that this long-standing decay in support for parliament, essentially uh, MPs, politicians, parliament, BBC, journalists, and newspapers, bankers, and you can carry on down this list of institutions that people no longer trust. Um, interestingly excluded, by the way, if you ask, you know, probably ask the question, uh, which prominent figures in, in British public life do you support? Trade union leaders are still actually quite widely supported. They've never been spectacularly well supported, but people generally uh, look to them as somebody who will be reasonably honest. So you'll find a good 50, 60% of people say, oh, well, we kind of trust them on some level. We don't have this kind of crisis of confidence of the trade union leaders in the way we might have senior bankers or politicians or journalists. Um, but partly it's a response to this crisis of le legitimacy of institutions like the BBC and the rest of it, we see this retreat, I think, back to saying, look, you've got the monarchy now. And if you look at the way the monarchy has reconstructed itself uh, from, what was it, 1995, the Queen's Annus Horribilis, you know, this terrible year where everything seemed to be going wrong for them, that, you know, people were just like, what is the point of these useless uh, freeloaders, to the last few years where consistently you've seen a real push by this government, supported by the media, to say, we've got the monarchy, isn't it great? And that's all going to come up again, presumably, in about a week or two weeks' time. I'm not particularly following the news on the, on the, the royal pregnancy. Presumably, that's, that's the kind of timescale we're looking at. So we get another round of, isn't the monarchy great? Aren't we great? Isn't everything OK? Really? A reconstruction of the monarchy there. And then also, underneath this, I think a use of the military uh, as a legitimising uh, force inside British society. Not, you know, obviously, the military gets used... Uh, and I think Alex might uh, touch on this, but gets used in a, a military sense abroad, very, very obviously, and increasingly so, uh, 
over the last 10 years, but at least part of the backwash of that has been an attempt to try and get the military back into civilian life in a way that I think is more pronounced, probably because legitimacy elsewhere has drained away than it has been certainly uh, that I can recall in my lifetime. So you, appear, you see the appearance of, for example, uh, the Army and the Navy and the Air Force, uh, the Olympic opening ceremony, and quite a heavy presence that was made there. You see the regular, you know, help for heroes, the rounds of Poppy, uh, the Poppy Day, suddenly going from something that just happens once a year to being like a big, like week-long thing of poppies everywhere, and you have to wear a poppy, and if you go on anything uh, where you're ever appearing in public, you get, you know, done if you're not wearing a poppy, that sort of thing. This kind of creation of a mystique around the military, precisely, of course, and it's not unrelated at the point at which you're having to use an increasingly elsewhere, but when everything else looks absolutely battered, you've still got basically the Queen and you've got the army, and that's what makes us all proud to be British and everything's okay and we can all carry on. So the response to this crisis of legitimacy is to find something else, to find something else to cling on to and push on that. There is also, I think, um, a kind of, within this decay of institutions, a kind of constitutional issue, if you like, that there's, there's the very obvious decline of the two-party system. Support is draining away from two and a half party system, isn't it? Sport is draining away from the two and a half parties. So it's draining away from the Tories and Labour. The Lib Dems have you know, almost completely uh, killed themselves off. They've had, what, 8 10% in the opinion polls now, from having been near 20% uh, back in 2010. Membership is continuing to decline. I mean, it's striking, actually, that under David Cameron, it's not particularly well reported. Uh, and it's unusual, because generally, if you get a new leader, what you find is that membership of your political party tends to pick up. But membership of the Conservatives under Cameron has more than halved since he became leader. You know, this real sort of draining way of support there. And the appearance actually of new, uh, new political formations, most obviously UKIP, which has sustained, despite the first-past-the-post system, despite the, the obviously undemocratic features of our electoral system, has now sustained a level of support that exceeds, uh, consistently exceeds that of the Liberal Democrats, and with a couple of pretty spectacular, if not quite, by-election wins, but certainly very, very major by-election votes. The decline of the two-party system, this historic way of organising uh, parliamentary uh, democracy, is disappearing in front of us, and changing to something else is certainly what it looks like. Um, a decline in support for the EU, uh, for the European Union, this kind of wider issue of Britain's relationship to the world, a major part of that, I think, is a clear decline in support for, certainly over the last uh, 20, 30 years. The appearance of issues like Scottish independence, um, which, which I think in general, uh, certainly the English left actually underestimates the importance of this one. There is a reason why you find that the major political parties are so keen on not having Scottish independence, that Tories and Labour are both lining up to say, we need to keep Scotland, is that it very directly reflects the uh, wider strategic interests of, of the British ruling class. If you lose Scotland, suddenly what was a major world economy loses a fair chunk of it first, Second, it's like, where do you put the nuclear submarines? Because they're in Scotland, and you need the nuclear submarines. They're basically completely militarily useless, but how else do you justify your position on the UN Security Council? And that matters a, a great deal. And what does it say about your membership of NATO? What does it say about your capacity to intervene militarily around the world? Your strategic position, at least in terms of your military position, is quite substantially undermined there. And it provokes, I would provoke, I think, quite a crisis a deepening crisis for British capitalism in a way that, that's, that's underestimated by, by the left here. Um, if you want to dig out, there's a, a decent article, I forget the guy's name, he was a former ambassador to the UN from Britain, now a senior fellow at uh, Chatham House. So basically, it's written for the New York Times. They basically just go through, donk, 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 just how serious uh, Scottish independence would be. So that's one of the issues that's come up there. Now, I've touched on the weakness of, of the Tories. There is the crisis of social democracy, the crisis of the Labour Party. Um, in several parts, the disappearance of its membership over, and you can take a long view of this, you can say the last 40, 50 years, and it's declined from close to a million members in the 1950s to something you'd be pushing 120, 130,000 today. Uh, Miliband, when elected, provokes a slight uptick in membership, as did Blair, actually. Uh, surprising as it now seems, but Blair managed to revive the Labour Party membership and recruit lots and lots of people when he was elected, all the way from 1994 to 1999. They rose from about 200,000 members to about something 400, 420,000 members by 1999. And then Blair started going mad and you know, membership started draining away somewhat from around about that point onwards. Uh, Miliband had a similar little blip. There was good 20, 30,000 members have joined. Those appear now to have left again. The Labour Party, as a membership organisation, is in a state of some disrepair. 
the trade unions as a component part of how social democracy operates, as a major support for the Labour Party, have declined substantially in membership uh, over the last 30 years or so, from close to half the workforce being in a trade union, you're now talking about something, you know, it's around about, what, 25 percent, maybe a third, and varies wildly. If you're in the public sector, it's about two-thirds are in a trade union, two-thirds of the workforce. If you're in the private sector, it's about, you know, 12, 15 percent are in a trade union. So it's very, very unevenly distributed throughout the economy. And the trade unions themselves don't work in the way that they used to. They've become, they've lost, I think, uh, what was within the trade union movement, a very independent-minded membership with the capacity to organise, so-called rank-and-file, rank-and-file organisations, that they didn't have to simply do what trade union leaders said or what the bureaucratic structures of the trade union would provide. There was this capacity for self-organisation that has now been completely, uh, essentially completely destroyed over the last 30 years or so. So you get these very, essentially really quite bureaucratic structures that are the trade unions that have now arrested their decline in membership but are not really doing much beyond that. Strike days lost uh, are still at record uh, low levels. Uh, and don't show much signs of uh, presence of picking up, although of course this doesn't rule out that things will turn quite rapidly uh, as the crisis develops. But the transformation of trade unions there, the decline of labour over here, adds up to a crisis institutionally of what social democracy looks like. That fits in turn, I think, with the wider and deeper issues uh, of British capitalism, which is not just that this crisis is forcing uh, austerity, which is really a code word forcing for the destruction of the welfare state over a long period of time, by, at the moment by a series of you know, death by a thousand cuts, effectively, uh, that's forcing the crisis there, but in fact also relates back to the efforts of new labour in government in particular to try and arrest a decline in British capitalism to uh, provide the space in which something like social democracy can still exist, and to do so by a deal with British capitalism relating to the City of London, quite deliberately so. Um, quite deliberately, Gordon Brown, as Shadow Chancellor at the time, went out of his way to appeal to the City of London, to appeal to finance, to say that you will be allowed off the leash uh, when we're in power, you'll be able to carry on doing whatever you want, we ask only that we can skim a little bit off in taxes and not pay for the NHS. And that was the deal that they attempted to strike. That it turned into a complete and utter disaster by 2008, doesn't remove the fact that for about 10 years it kind of worked, that the thing functioned, that New Labour was able to sustain this kind of compromise position, this ability to hold on to some of the bits that social democracy, the Labour Party historically won, like the NHS, like the welfare state, and even expand some of those things, whilst you know, privatising bits of it and introducing tuition fees, but expand some of those things over 10 years because of this deal. It was a deal based on the very, very shaky foundations of allowing the City of London and finance to do what it wants. When that collapses, the entire deal is thrown into question. Now, the response of that from the trade union, uh, rather from the Labour leadership, as of now, is to accept that the deal has collapsed and then do nothing whatsoever to replace it. So they accept austerity, uh, which is singularly stupid. I mean, we think austerity is bad now, and it is bad, and it's already producing very, very obvious social uh, effects. But Osborne, not completely stupidly, has scheduled it to accelerate after 2015. So in other words, should Labour get elected, and they're saying they're committed to this thing, they're committed to an accelerated programme of destroying everything Labour once stood for. Which is, if, even if it doesn't look like a complete crisis for the party now, it certainly will be by 2015 or 2016. And we can see a glimmer of that already, I think, in the dispute that's grown up over the last few weeks between Unite, which is led by uh, Len McCluskey, who is committed to reclaiming the Labour Party, trying to drag it back to something like its old social democratic, more left-wing uh, positioning, and it's something that represents working people and their aspirations, and rather this peculiar setup that New Labour has become, that Miliband has continued. Drag it back in that direction, and uh, Miliband, who is, you know, being charitable, too pathetic to stand up to his own right-wing and the Blairites, who are very well organised, much better organised inside the party than the trade unions are, uh, and has therefore collapsed into simply supporting them. And you can see a glimmer, I think, of what he's liable to be the major, major arguments that are scheduled essentially after, I think, the next general election, after 2015, with the acceleration of austerity, you're starting to see glimmers of that now. So this is the three sets of the crisis, very, very quickly, because I'm getting waved up. How do we, how do we deal with this, and what, what, what is the immediate kind of responses to the thing? I think the first one is that, in practice, 
we have to defend the gains that social democracy made. We have to defend things like the NHS and the welfare state, not because they're brilliant in themselves. I mean, they're not bad. They're certainly better than being got rid of, and that's precisely why you defend the things. But you have to defend them. So any idea that in response to a wider crisis, we can start to suddenly raise uh, questions, if you like, about you know, what we do instead, how we run a welfare state differently. Well, there is a space for that kind of argument. There is a space for critique there, but the starting point has to be de defending what we got and work out how you make it better, not simply allowing a crisis to happen and then say, oh, well, perhaps it never really worked anyway. And there is a thing uh, knocking about a kind of slightly mad, sort of anarchist -y argument that looks, starts to look a little bit like that. That's one part of it. The second part of it, I think, is we have to understand that this is a national crisis. It's a crisis of the whole regime. It's not a crisis of just what's happening in, to pick one example, Lambeth, or what's happening in, you know, just North London, or what's happening in X, Y, or Z town or city throughout the country. It's a crisis of the entire thing, and it's a crisis that is now being driven and organised, in effect, by a government that whose response to the wider crisis is to smash up social democracy, make it impossible for social democracy to return, and try and create some basis for British capitalism to continue, essentially without an NHS, without a welfare state, without what it sees as all these heavy costs. Uh, our response has to be nationally organised, so that points towards uh, the People's Assembly very immediately. The weakness over the last few years has been that although there have been very good local campaigns against specific cuts in lots and lots of different places, you know, people have organised, they have defended swimming pools, childcare, libraries, you can go for a big list. What they haven't been able to do is stop the general drive because they haven't been nationally organised. You have to be nationally organised to cope with uh, something like this. It has to be, I think at this point in time, the only game in town really is the People's Assembly and that everything we do locally has to relate back to what we're doing nationally on the People's Assembly. And the final bit, of course, is that defending things is all very well. It creates a space to argue for an alternative. I don't think we have any particular commitment I don't think we should have any particular commitment to the British state, the British regime, to social democracy as it's organised. I think we have to have an argument about how we might do things differently. That what are the alternatives to simply defending ourselves against the crisis? That how do we democratise the economy? How do we uh, create jobs? How do we have investment in renewable energy? How do we actually start to build an economy that looks like one we like, and a society that looks like one we like, rather than simply having to be in the back foot defending the whole time? We have to start to open that question. That question, of course, also in the end, opens up to us saying, well, what do you do instead of capitalism? What do you do instead of the system that always produces this crisis, that always produces this drive to squeeze out anything worthwhile people have won? What are the alternatives to it, and how do you organise to get there? Anyway, finish on that one.